Good evening, everybody um, in, uh, in Zoom land. Um, my name is Ben Castro, and I'm uh, excited to welcome you to our second webinar, where we're um, uh, looking at how to build a fit for purpose uh, policy institute uh, for environment and sustainability in the context of Asia. Uh, and I've been, I've been uh, asked by our Dean Danny Kwa to initiate uh, several conversations uh, uh, to with uh, government uh, experts and officials, the corporate sector, non-governmental organizations and philanthropy to think about how we can best design this new institute. And today is the second part of that conversation. Uh, we're also drawing on the rich history of the Institute of Water Policy within our school that has long developed a really good way to think about doing fit for purpose uh, policy analysis that can help meet the, the needs of different stakeholders uh, and improve policy capacity around impacts on the ground. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn over the, the moderating uh, efforts for today, who will introduce our panel to my colleague, uh, Vino Thomas, who like our other panelists has a very long CV and an illustrious career. I'll just highlight that he's been involved extensively at the ADB and World Bank as vice presidents in promoting uh, climate finance and other mechanisms to address the climate and biodiversity crises while promoting a development. And has also written books on how to link practitioner concerns with the academic scholarly community. Uh, so with that, I welcome my colleague, Do uh, Dr. Vino Thomas and give the floor to him. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, Ben. Um, it's uh, really wonderful to have this occasion today. Um, and uh, I first want to uh, pay tribute uh, to the uh, audience and participants who have shown interest in this uh, uh, topic. Um, and I think they're having trouble uh, starting my video, but let me continue. It probably will get fixed as we go along. Um, so we are lucky to have a very illustrious uh, panel. Um, um, and um, they, uh, I'm going to introduce them uh, uh, right now. Uh, they have very long and uh, illustrious uh, CVs, which are available uh, on the website. Uh, but from my side, let me just take them uh, uh, in a particular order that we have here in terms of the speaking today. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Kavik Kumar uh, Muruganathan uh, is, is uh, going to be uh, the first speaker, and he's a teaching faculty uh, at the School of Design and Environment at the Nas National University of Singapore and the APAC. Um, so he's really distinguished in terms of his uh, uh, experience uh, in the whole sustainability area including uh, supply chain experiences in Europe, APAC, and Africa. And I might just add one more uh, of his background and experience in the agri-commodity sector as being very interesting as well. Uh, previous to that uh, is really a very long uh, list of achievements, uh, which uh, I'll let you uh, look at later. Um, so thank you for joining us. And um, uh, the uh, second speaker, um, Mr. Constant, Van Eshot, whom I will uh, introduce first as the director currently of Asia Pacific uh, World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, so again, sustainability and particularly construction sector exper expertise uh, dis dif distinguish him. Uh, and uh, he has been on the uh, board of two uh, nonprofit organization and uh, part of the executive council of the Sustainable Business Network. Uh, so very, very fitting that uh, he could join us today. <clears throat> uh, let me then introduce uh, Mr. Sean Kidney, uh, who really uh, has done a remarkable work, a co-founder and CEO of Climate Bonds Initiative and a professor uh, in practice at the University of London. Um, on the climate bond side, uh, it's really a very, very extensive uh, experience, uh, especially in green bond. So I uh, think of him as Mr. Green Bond, um, and uh, he's worked all over, uh, all over the world. Uh, extraordinary uh, experience in the private sector as well. And uh, so we are very, very lucky to have him to get that really, I mean, one of the most promising things we hear about in this whole climate debate 
is whether this could just capture the world and uh, what you will say about that will resonate a great deal uh, this evening. Uh, and then last not but, but least, uh, not least, uh, Steve, Mr. Steve uh, Turnstall, uh, is director of uh, Turnstall Associates um, uh, and uh, also with a very, very uh, sterling uh, uh, resume. Uh, he has been CEO, managing director, chairman equivalent of 12 companies in four countries uh, and uh, uh, has uh, also uh, worked as uh, in the NGO civil society side of things and brings a wealth of experience. Um, so that's the lineup for us today. Um, and um, I'm sorry, my video is not coming on and I don't want to mess up any more on my side. And I don't know if the problem is here or uh, at the center, but if this is functioning well enough, uh, shall we continue, Ben? Uh, yes, please do. Okay. It all, it all's good. All right. So um, in the time, an hour and 15 minutes that ha we have, um, I, I would like to dive in pretty much right away in going to the panelists with a round of two questions and um, we can see uh, which if they would choose to uh, focus on one or the other. Um, and um, it's really related uh, to the idea that Ben mentioned of uh, a new institute um, devoted uh, to the issue of sustainability uh, at, at, at LKY and uh, what would be the terms of reference and what would be most useful from the eyes of real practitioners like the four people we have today. So with that in mind, uh, uh, the first thing I would like to ask uh, about is based on your and your organization's experience, uh, what might be the most important uh, thing that a public policy institute might do? Uh, not being a talk shop, but really being uh, uh, helpful. And what might you uh, and in your world benefit the most? Uh, you can imagine this question could not come at a more critical time uh, when we are literally at a crossroads and some would argue that the tipping point has already been passed. So we need to act. So with that sense of urgency, when you have an institute, we are keenly aware that it needs to add value soon and it really needs to be value added as well. So with that, may I look uh, first go uh, to Kavik Kumar. Uh, you might take that up uh, uh, and uh, we'll uh, go from there. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Vinod, and thanks for having me here. Um, just to also set the context, as you rightly mentioned, it's really uh, unprecedented times. And of course, as we speak, I think it's very opportune that the COP26 talks are you know, uh, about to get started as well in Glasgow. Uh, from a public policy perspective and being an industrial practitioner, I think a lot of times the challenges that we face relates to applicability of these policies in the work that we do. A lot of times we find it hard to interpret and contextualize policies for the work we do. And uh, what are one of the things I would urge uh, public policies uh, schools for the future would to look into the detail of understanding the nuances within industries and understanding the stakeholder needs that would be affected by such policies that are being put out. Uh, so for instance, uh, being in the renewable energy sector, very new sector, uh, uh, and of course, particularly renewable fuel, uh, we find a lot of challenges in terms of interpreting uh, the legislation that has been passed in, in some of these markets, because uh, it's, it's a stack of documents. And for us as practitioners, making wanting to make tangible change occur on the ground, we find it very hard to interpret these requirements. How do we translate a sheet of paper or stacks of documents into tangible uh, actions, quantifiable tangible actions on the ground? So I think this is one of the, the most important challenges that we face as industry practitioners. And of course, contextualization is very important. Uh, I mean, industries can be very broad, but I think certain industries need a bit more contextualization. So I would say uh, public policy schools need to partner more uh, extensively with stakeholders uh, uh, on uh, public policy creation. Uh, by that, what I mean uh, is to sense the ground and to have interactions that 
understand the challenges uh, institutions and corporates face in implementing policy. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we face in, in today's time. And I hope that that changes in the new, near future because a lot of these challenges are really uh, cross-cutting across many issues, uh, for example, not just environmental issues. So environmental policies should also look into other aspects, the aspects of social issues, governance issues as well. So a lot of cross-sectoral or uh, cross-cutting work is required to understand the nuances and the broad ranging effects or impacts of certain policy. And I think policy also has a key role to play in accountability and, of course, uh, creating impact on the ground. A lot of times policy seems to be a piece of paper that has been put out uh, for practitioners to abide by. But uh, one thing that policy sort of fails to do is sort of, you know, tie in the tail end, which is what comes out at the end of policy making. Are we able to really measure and uh, really account for the change that we wanted to create through that policy. And I'm sure uh, some of the speakers here might uh, add on to that, especially probably Sean uh, uh, on green bonds and all these things. But I think that's one of the biggest things that we see lacking in policy because policy is meant to also create change and especially very pertinent at, in today's time and age. How do we actually uh, sort of, uh, you know, make policy to make concrete, tangible changes as well? And very important as well, uh, policy should not just cut vertically, it should also cut laterally and make, make, it, uh, make things more inclusive. All right, how can we get industries to collaborate in terms of policy formulation? I think that's very uh, important, uh, not just within certain jurisdictions, but across many jurisdictions, because today's industries do not just operate in a single ge geography. A lot of our operations uh, you know, are based out of uh, the the the, the, the the, uh, the geographies that we are instituted as a corporate. So for example, for us, we are, our supply chains are all mostly uh, starting from this part of the world, the Asia Pacific, before our end products are actually sold to the markets in the EU and the North America. So how do we actually understand those chains end to end? And how do we make uh, policies that are just and equitable? I think that's another issue that we want to really enforce and hope uh, this materializes within the, the, the sphere of public policy, and I hope that the schools of uh, the future schools of public, uh, the future public policy schools, uh, will address and seek recourse for these issues. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges that they face. But I think uh, really schools have to also believe in the power of uncommon collaborations because that is how change happens in in, in today's world. We believe, and I, as an organization, we we believe in partnerships. So we hope that. Uh, we want to also have that interaction with public policy schools to, to enable those changes to happen on the ground. So these are just my few uh, takeaways, uh, Dr. Vinod, and I'm happy to add on to it at, uh, as we discuss along the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kavi Kumar. I think um, uh, what you said resonates uh, very strongly. Uh, for example, the industry uh, contextualization with partnership, and uh, we might think of which are the examples that have been scaled up and we now see the benefits of that and uh, we may learn from that. So you're, you're, we'll come back to your words, I'm sure. Um, to just continue, um, shall I uh, call on uh, Constant to come in? And let me just add that as we go along uh, that um, you know we thought of four areas where uh, some of our work might revolve around. One is energy, the idea of um, management of waste and circular economy, biodiversity, water, so those four in particular. So to the extent that you think that those do comprise uh, specific areas, uh, of course, it also matches a bit of our expertise uh, or not, uh, please do uh, comment as well. So over to you, uh, Constant. Thank you very much for having me. So. My name is Constant Van Ershot. Um, I'm working for WBCSD, uh, so probably not many of you know about it. It's a horrible acronym, but it's the World Business Council for System Development. The good news about it is if you Google it, because there has no, no vowels, then no one else uses this, you will automatically end up in, on our website. We are industry association, nonprofit, uh, and we have been around for 26 years, creating standards, uh, by industry for industry exclusively for sustainability. So if you are familiar with the uh, greenhouse gas protocol, 
So these, which is mandated in many places around the world to calculate and report CO2 emissions. So we have done this for many different uh, sectors. Um, my first comment when I received this invitation, <clears throat> I was kind of, I found the name of the Institute very peculiar. Uh, and I put it this out there because to me, sustainability is ESG, environmental, social and governance. So I was wondering why do you repeat environment and sustainability because sustainability embeds environment. But I think that can be discussed later. Um, uh, the other question is I have is <clears throat> the policy institute is a scope and boundaries. Whether you are looking at Singapore or the region, uh, so that's very important when you look at the type of policies and regulations that this institute uh, should look at. You know, typically, if you look at, at climate, of course, it, it's broader than just Singapore. When you look at biodiversity and nature loss, uh, it should include, you know, a regional approach and so forth. So, so, so that's just my my kind of first questions. Um, and I think I, I can echo uh, Kavi Kumar's uh, uh, kind of comment on engaging with the private sector. But I would take another spin to it. I'm European, I'm Swiss, and I've worked for Lafarge, a cement company, and I was working at SEMBIO, which is an industry association that actually engaged with the European Parliament in making policies. In Asia, I don't see many companies taking the role or the leadership to engage with policymakers. It's more kind of the, the government who is taking the lead. Whereas in, in many instances, it's actually in the industry's interest to shape policies together with government. So I think there's a change of, uh, you know, a mindset needs to happen on the private sector. And if the Institute can, of course, also be open to this, then so it, it, it's a dual approach, I would say. Uh, the private sector needs to do this as well as uh, the, the Institute and the uh, and, and governments here. Then what I would expect from an institute and from a school is, is really to understand <clears throat> that business does not like surprises. We are perfectly happy to have a carbon price. We are unhappy if it comes up on Monday morning at 8 a.m. We need to have a calendar of you know, when those things are happening so that we can embed those new constraints in our operations or in, in our decision-making process. So having a visibility on what's coming and, and the visibility comes by engaging. So, so, I mean, the private sector cannot say, oh, well, we're not happy because you know, technically it's difficult to implement uh, if they don't engage proactively with the government in shaping the policies that are applicable, yeah. So the visibility, predictability, and consistency of policies, harmonization of policies in, in a region. You know, a lot of businesses say, well, you know, what's happening in Thailand or Malaysia you know, doesn't fit with uh, Singapore. We have so many things that are kind of counterproductive and you know, duplicate. And, and, then the, <clears throat> and then the last one is, is really to create a level playing field. We don't want to encourage uh, uh, well, you know, unfair competition. For example, carbon price could be felt as being unfair to be applicable to Singapore and not Malaysia. See, so creating a level, and, and it goes back to my question on you know, what is the aim and goal of policies and what is the scope and what are the boundaries that you know, an institute like this should actually define. And I, I, stop, I stop here, <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Constant. Very uh, thought-provoking, actually, and and uh, maybe it's, uh, it's one thing that you said along the way, uh, which uh, got my interest uh, to get a bit more clarif clarification. You might come back later. I think when you mentioned the environment and or uh, sustainability, um, might you just take a thirty-second stab at elaborating on that? Yeah, well, <clears throat> sustainability is about an
I think we lost you, Constant. I think we've lost Constant. Yeah. So perhaps you know you can. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, Constant. I, <laughs> with my video off, I also worried that the muting or the problem was on my side. So, Constant, while you come back in, uh, let's go uh, to um, Sean uh, on roughly the same family of questions. Okay, so I've got um, two thoughts for you. The first thought is you need to understand the challenge and you need to help others understand the challenge. That is a problem. You need to help with that. And then you need to explore and promote the solution set, especially the intersection between public and private. So let me give you some details. On the challenge, the fundamental, the dominant, the overarching issue in sustainability is climate. We are currently heading for utter catastrophe. Our policymakers do not understand this. Our corporate leaders do not understand this. Certainly the public doesn't understand it. That's not really the issue here. There's always a few ones. I'm happy to accept that. But, you know, if we don't meet our global target, let's call it the IPCC line on the sand, of 55% reductions by 2050, we have a very substantially increased risk of utterly catastrophic outcomes in the next 30 years. And by catastrophic, I will point you to the 1600s when we had two degrees cooling as a result of killing off all those American Indians of smallpox and measles and the collapse of civilizations in America and the regrowth, the forest regrowth sucks so much carbon out of the atmosphere, kind of hopeful. If Borneo could regrow all that forest, who knows what we might do? But that two degrees cooling we had meant we lost a third of the world's population through war, through famine and plague. And that is what we're looking at on the lower trajectories of climate change. But the higher trajectories are four to five to six degrees warming. The human species has never existed on this planet. In fact, life in modern, in the last few million years has not existed in temperature ranges outside a mean of two degrees from a, from a traveling trajectory. So we're talking about extreme changes where there is no certainty the human species will survive. And there is no certainty life will survive. If we don't understand the depth of the challenge, we cannot understand the solutions that are required. So the translation of the science, and I say translation, because as you know, science is very careful, written papers and so on. And I can remember one of the things that started me on the journey I'm on was reading the proceedings of the Conference of Catastrophic Climate Change at Exeter University in the mid 2000s that was chaired by Tony Blair. And I had to read the papers three times before I realized what was going on. The papers were actually saying in the most careful language, this is very, very severe. And I, at that point, said, Jesus Christ, I've got to spend the rest of my life working that I can't be a parent to my four daughters if I don't do something about this in whatever little way I can. So the translation of the science is an absolutely imperative responsibility of those in academia, especially those who take on the mantle of talking about sustainability. You have an extra responsibility. Noting that we have not been very successful because we have not successfully influenced the body corporate, the world, where emissions have continued to rise. We put in more emissions to the atmosphere in the last 30 years than in the previous 150 years, which is sending us on this road to oblivion. It's not about investor opinion, the area I work in. It's not about government opinion. It is about the science. And that, I'm going to put it this way, is the lesson to be learned from the pandemic. Where those governments that listened to the scientists and acted quickly had a better result than those led by idiots who refused to listen to the science, the US, Brazil, the UK, and saw mass death. It's exactly the same situation. Now, of course, it's exactly the same situation for a number of reasons, which takes me to some of my solutions here. The pandemic is a climate-related emergency. It's a result of biodiversity destruction in South and Southeast Asia, bat colonies being forced together 
pathogens jumping between species and then to humans. That's essentially what's happened. We're going to get, according to the IPCC Health Committee, a lot more of these this century. We need to learn from the evidence, not the opinion, of what has worked in the last year and a half or two years to build our resilience to climate shocks. And let's start calling them that. Because while I'm deeply sympathetic with the previous speaker's comments that business does not like surprises, one thing I can guarantee you, climate change is about surprises. This is not non-linear change. Sorry, this is not linear change we're going into. It is non-linear with a lot of very ugly spikes. 2020 is the beginning of what the 21st century looks like for a variety of reasons. We've got to prepare, guys. Translating the science. That's just, you're, something that an academic needs to do. So not just about mitigation, but also about preparedness for the future. Because what we try to do, we're trying to manage the risks facing our societies, our economies, our corporates, our governments in a better and more informed fashion. We do have this extraordinary development of science, which is an ability to foresee into the future better than ever before in history. We have not translated that adequately yet into government policy or corporate policy. We're working on it. The more we can do that translation, the better the decisions we make will be. So that's my first point for comment. <laughs> my second point, explore and promote the nature of the intersection between private investment, corporate activity and government. We don't address the challenges that are coming towards us, the freight train coming down the railway, unless we act in concert. It is not possible. I do not believe the private sector can save us, I'm afraid. I don't believe government can save us. It has to be a collaboration. And so it has always been. We have not built our economies on the back of any one sector going off and doing it. Largely, with maybe some exceptions in communist regimes, largely it has been a collaboration, an active, sometimes forced, but nevertheless a collaboration between those that hold the money, those that hold the expertise, the dynamism, the innovation, and those that can set the rules and set the framework and skew the system in a certain direction. Government. There's a lot to be done to explain how that works. Singapore is a fantastic place to be doing that work because, of course, this is what the Singaporean government has done since, since the 1960s in a way that other governments have not done adequately. The US has lurched from doing this, not doing that, although it is worth noting that the US economy has been built on 200 years of selective policy guarantees by the government for debt. It's been the primary instrument that the US has used from the 1790s, when we stood as first started seeing the use of guarantees for debt by the, by the federals. We even had guarantees for securitizations of slaves in the 1830s, by Louisiana state. That's the extent to which guarantees were used to prop up bits of the economy for, well, let's call it charitably, public policy purposes. But of course, there's more than that. The US has also been a place where public sector venture capital was pioneered in 1947. There are still 50 government seeded venture capital funds in the US, which tend to have a 10 year horizon for returns not the three year horizons that the fabled legendary Silicon Valley companies do have. In fact, they are not the ones that have driven innovation in the US economy. It's the public sector seeded venture capital funds that have been the real underpinning of long-term investment in technological innovation, which has led to the iPhone and all the other things that we now have. That story has to be told and it has to be told to emerging markets which is where 70% of the capex to address climate change will happen in the next 30 years. It's not going to be a rich change. It's going to be an emerging market, ASEAN, Africa, South Asia. There are many other different aspects of this story. How China's big bets worked in the 1990s, the role of the China Development Bank, extraordinary role. Imagine creating cities out of paddy fields. All of that story with a green filter, please, needs to be told and expanded. 
the role of regulators. MAS is currently involved actively in the network of greening the financial system. There is more to be done in the role of MAS in making this change, which is a discussion lively underway, very much underway out of the NGFS, but it needs pushing and it needs in, being informed by history. You know, the old adage, we don't know history, et cetera, et cetera. Well, unfortunately, when it comes to the role of the public sector in mobilizing and working with private capital, that history is not very visible. It is absolutely central to the growth of our economies. The US, China, and Singapore are three notable economies, but I can point you to Jean Monnet's plans in the, in the 1950s in the US to bring together capital and, and finance and government. I can point you to no end of examples. It's central to rapid change, especially. Let you wind down and come back to this again in our second round. <clears throat> I just want to say my last point, you know, is back to my first point, urgency. One thing you can do in translating the science is to continue the drumbeat of urgency. Only a few short years to go. Excellent. I mean, this is uh, both scary and inspiring. Uh, one thing stuck in my mind, I mean, comparison with the pandemic, it, one has to ask, how is it that uh, the world was able to raise 20 trillion dollars in six to nine months for the pandemic and we are struggling to get 100 billion uh, a year uh, from the developed countries for the biggest crisis of them all um, so anyway we leave it at that for the moment and let me go straight to uh, steve for a final set of remarks on this area well thank you very much for, for inviting me to join this and um uh, if there's a bit of background, I've been in Asia for 30 years, uh, running different companies, running NGOs as well. And I've, I've also I got Sean's strong sense of the need for urgency. I've been a member of the World Wildlife Fund for 40 years. And frankly, we've had very little impact during that time. And I often end up apologizing to my children for the fact that we've wrecked the planet when we, uh, when we should have been fixing it. I think the science is now conclusive. I don't think there's anybody who's taken seriously on a global stage who's questioning the science. But I would agree entirely with Sean that it's all about the communication, the education, and how we bring that out and how we can actually make change for business. Um, I want to quote a couple of things. I want to quote, uh, so Temasek supported the Ecosperity Week at the end of September, where you had a lot of global CEOs talking about what they were going to do. The one that struck me in their comments that I thought were most profound was um, Sonny Vergese, the Olam CEO. Olam's the world's largest farmer and probably one of the world's largest soft commodity traders. He's been, he's been passionate about sustainability for about four or five years. He had a he had a come to Jesus moment on it and in the same way that Sean's emotive about it. And he said, and I quote, I've spoken to 250 chief executives who have made net zero commitments. None of us has a clue how we'll get there. He said, climate action is not about bold announcements. It's about getting it done. There's a man who wants to get it done. I mean, I know Sonny and he does want to get it done. He wants to make a difference, but he doesn't know how to do it. Let me give you one simple example. We talked a bit about a couple of people touched briefly on carbon offset. So the range of pricing today varies depending on where you are. It's something like $1 in some places per ton of CO2. The other outlier at the other extreme is Sweden, where their current carbon tax offset rate is $128 a ton. But that's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. It's not consistent. How can you deal with that as a business? Meanwhile, while you've got things like that going on, there was an interview this week I saw published from uh, a representative of one of the world's largest oil companies. And I won't say who they are, but you'll work it out pretty quickly. Um, their quote was that their carbon capture systems are so good now they can enable Southeast Asia to continue along its current economic development path to provide affordable energy and products that support modern life, whilst also addressing climate change concerns. 
Uh, now, so far as I knew, carbon sequestration at scale is largely unproven at the moment. I don't see anybody is doing it effectively. And yet you've got one of the, the world's largest uh, petrochemical companies saying they've got it all sussed, carry on as usual. We don't have to change what we're doing at our corporate level. So I think the challenge is going to be that CEOs will always be forced to put their profits first by hardcore financial stakeholders unless they're given some real wriggle room to adjust their course to be more sustainable. And that's gonna have to come through regulatory or other tools. And it has to come through policy institutes like the one you're proposing here, so that you can influence government to, to take the right sort of decisions. The challenge of course, is that it's that, uh, you know, the, the old issue with the uh, Goldilocks and the porridge, you, you can be, you know, not too hot, not too cold. If you, if you're too much ahead of the pack, do you risk all your companies losing competitiveness? And this is the, the practicality that I know people like Sean find very frustrating. I find it deeply frustrating as well. You can't, it's that, it's that old thing, you know, there's the pack of zebras running across the plains and the first one who gets to the river crosses boldly and gets eaten by the, um, the crocodiles of rapacious shareholders. Meanwhile, the one at the back gets eaten by the lions. So how do you, how do you stay in the middle of the pack? How do you be effective? How do you bring all these people along, all these CEOs along who want to do good uh, without, uh, you know, without making the whole thing so slow that it's intractable and doesn't, doesn't really make any difference at all? I think those are the biggest challenges I see policy and direction to government to urge the speed that Sean was talking about and to urge change on businesses in a consistent way as being the key things that can be delivered. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, we, uh, we really have a, a, a wealth of uh, interventions from all, all of you. Uh, I don't have time to do a follow-up question uh, but may I just uh, put this in a rhetor rhetoric way, uh, um, especially uh, to uh, Steve um, as the last speaker. Uh, you know, if the bottom line would still be uh, at the end of the day, uh, the financial bottom line, uh, you know, if, if the damages from climate change were proportionate to who is responsible somehow, uh, by country or by company or by something. Uh, the problem would be solved immediately, even with a single bottom line. So um, since that's not the case, do we really not need to go to a command and control world because we will have run out of time? Let me just leave it as a rhetorical question and I'm sorry that uh, time is not on our side. Um, so um, in a second round, um, if I may just go in the same order, uh, it's kind of an elaboration of what you touched on. Uh, I think you hit the substance of the issues pretty hard. Uh, a bit more on the science and the engineering side, if you will. Um, some uh, even boutique examples that could be scaled up and might surprise us, that would be great. But in particular, some of the lines of thoughts that you had on partnerships, Business and, uh, business and government, academia and policy, academia and business. Uh, something is there that we are not, we are just missing. Are there any examples that are really worthy of scaling up? Uh, what we as a startup academia on this one might really keep in mind uh, in the, in the, even in the world of Southeast Asia and Asia would be fine. And maybe even connecting to the communications point he made. It's unthinkable that we have the biggest knowledge action divide humanity has ever seen. You know so much about the science of climate change, three Nobel Prizes this year, and action could not have lagged worse in relation to the damage. I mean, can you imagine when such death and destruction occurs? You, you know, we are not reducing the problem, we are increasing the problem with the emissions rising to 400 and near 20 parts per million. So, you know, touch on those, but of course, from the point of view of, of how we might help and what do you, do you need in your world to do more? Because you are all doing 
God's work. Okay, so same order. Uh, may I just uh, call on Kavit Kumar? Yeah, I think that essentially is the the, the, the million dollar question, right? I mean, um, we, we have so much, we have a rich repository of data, we have a rich repository of information, but how are we making it work for the good of the, the environment, right? So I think some of the speakers have touched on, right? I mean, um, and I, I completely agree on, uh, you know, some of the, the statements made, especially those on really asking, you know, the leaders of corporates on how much do they know about the change they are making. And that is where I feel institutions and academia have, have a role to play as, as some sort of a consultant or, 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 a, or a thought leader in this space, because I think this represents opportunities which are in essence some sort of challenges. And how do we change these challenges into opportunities for public uh, policy institutions? I see that as forefront. I think there's a lot of science, but how do we contextualize all this information? How do we contextualize concepts like science-based targets? How do we contextualize things like the task force for, for climate-related financial disclosures into nuanced uh, sort of uh, narratives that can actually be put across to leaders for them to understand and internalize and communicate it throughout the value chain. So I think that's where one of the roles of the public policy school is to show the bigger picture, right? Um, what does it take for you know the actors in this ecosystem to come together to create that change, right? So I think that's one of the things that the public policy schools of the future should be striving to do. How do we pull in downstream actors? How do we enable civil society organizations to have a very open, uh, candid conversation with corporate leaders? How do we get a person like Greta Thunberg to come to the room and really be very diplomatic and showing a lot of decorum and speaking to some of the biggest CEOs of companies around the world? I think that is the sort of thing that could value add to what is being done around the public policy scope of things. As I said, I think there's a lot of alignment needed. Uh, sometimes I see a lot of competing and conflicting interests as well. So how does institutions, uh, you know, for example, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy uh, be some sort of a barometer where they can align all these conflicting and competing interests to create value? Because I, think I just want to touch on this concept of value, right? I mean, the value that we want to create through the work of public policy has to be tangible on the ground, right? And uh, as some of the speakers have alluded to, I mean, clearly the science has shown that, you know, we are on the right or wrong side of the climate tra trajectory. So how do we show them the right path and how do we create the right sort of value uh, within the ecosystem to realize that we need a concerted effort, uh, a co-creation of value to really transform the way we do business in today's world. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we face. And I hope that, you know, public policy schools can play a role in that, you know, uh, being that sort of orchestrator in this, uh, you know, ecosystem that we are working in. And, you know, and one more thing I, I thought of is also the long-term horizon, right? How do we as uh, institutions look at, you know, things uh, 10 to 15 years down the road. How do we prepare for that? You know, COVID was one example. No one saw it coming. It transformed how we did business, transform how we started to work and transform the whole agenda on climate change. So I think one of the things that uh, public policy schools should also be offering to sort of corporates is to look at the whole concept of future and foresight, right? How do we do that sort of horizon scanning? How do we envisage such scenarios, such black swan events, and make sure that we don't leave any stone unturned? And this is the value that we can provide to corporates who really are looking for this sort of information to also stay ahead of the curve. So I, I guess it's, it's a multitude of issues. And I think a lot of times, um, especially when projects are instituted uh, for a start. And, you know, uh, a lot of it is in its infancy, right? I mean, when we come together to work on solutions, uh, industry partnerships, especially, when we do pilots, a lot of these programs tend to just end up as pilots, right? So how do we have an academic point of view coming in to say that, you know, we need to last the course? How do we ensure that these pilots actually move beyond pilots and prototypes 
to really scale up to create that sort of value. And that's where institutions can offer thought leadership and of course, connect the dots to really make sense of what's happening on the ground to really advance the agendas, the common or shared agendas uh, that corporates have and industry associations have. So I, I think in, in a nutshell, these are some of the issues that I think uh, public policy institutions of the future can really work on to help corporates uh, build a truly sustainable uh, you know, uh, way of operating in a truly sustainable business world. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kavi Kumar. Now, um, as we go to Constant, Sean, and Steve, I, I, I'll take the liberty of injecting three questions that were uh, on the Q&A box. So if you could weave that in to the extent that it is natural to do so, uh, please do. Um, one is particularly with a focus on Southeast Asia. Uh, how, in your experience, can we really do better in bridging private and government initiatives? They seem to go uh, a bit more in parallel than in um, sync. Uh, the other is uh, specifically uh, the experience uh, around the world on tax havens. Do they help or do they hurt? And if they hinder, what are we going to do about that uh, when it comes to climate change? And the third, related to the first, um, uh, the uh, question is, uh, Singapore has done a bit uh, on private uh, government linkages. What can other countries in Southeast Asia and elsewhere do? So these questions come from Willie, Steve, and Peter, and thank you for that. But I leave you to pick them up as you go along. Um, so, um, Constant? Yes. Thank you. Um, before I go into those three questions, I just wanted to highlight you know, the four priorities that I think, and we think as an organization, you know, should be focused on, which is climate action, nature action, equity, you know, to address inequality, rising inequalities. And the fourth one is valuation. And I, I'm saying this because <clears throat> science uh, and measurements are what actually drives corporates as well. And standards already exist. The issue is not science. We know how to do, for example, life cycle assessment so that we can actually measure the carbon footprint of products and services. The issue is that there is no regulation that actually enforces the use of life cycle analysis so that companies can actually do proper carbon footprinting. So I take the example of the construction industry. If you want to decarbonize the construction sector, you need to have what we call environmental product declarations, which is based on ISO, scientific-based life cycle analysis. Uh, no regulation actually requires this uh, here in the region, whether, you know, uh, in Singapore, Hong Kong, or Indonesia. But that's a, that's a very practical tool on how to actually uh, measure your know, environmental impact. Um, and the, so, the, uh, but, so that, that's more a te technical question. So standards exist. There is no regulatory framework that actually encourages companies to use those you know, in, at scale. Uh, and to the example of, you know, how do we go about uh, creating collaboration? I'll give you one example on circular economy. And you, you put circular economy as, as one of the pillar. I would kind of challenge this because circular economy is about achieving certain goals. Like energy is about achieving certain goals. What are those goals? The goals are climate or the goals are reducing the loss of biodiversity. Yes. For on circular economy, for example, <clears throat> we did a survey amongst 75 multinationals and we asked them, how do you measure how circular you are? And the answer is, well, we use consultants. We don't know how they do it, but they come up with a figure that we are 9%, 12 or 15%. So they came together, industry, 28 companies, multinational companies, and said, we need to establish a standard on defining how to measure our level of circularity at product or um, uh, factory level. 
So this standard exists now. We have been working two years on this. The next step is how can those, can those metrics actually be embedded in regulations or policies? So we should be able to say, well, you need to use a recognized framework like the CO2, you know, the greenhouse gas protocol. You can do this on circular economy as well. So what I'm saying here is that, uh, you know, policies need to have a certain goal and reg reg regulations need to enforce uh, those, those goals by making them tangible and you can measure. So whether it's at product level or circular economy level uh, or water for, for that matter. So I think, I think that's the process on how to get alignment on, on the tools and the standards. And the next step is how can we, can the policy institute actually make sure that those standards that exist already are being applied uh, at, uh, at, uh, you know, at industry and country level. And just one a last point, if I may, COP will arrive soon. Uh, we are issuing a manifesto for climate recovery. In this manifesto, we have two actions, 12 actions on methane, on coal, how to decarbonize hydrogen, et cetera. And at the same time, we have for each of those actions, policy asks. That's at the UN and COP level, but similar things can, 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 can happen at ASEAN level. So those policy requirements so will be issued uh, at COP26 and they, they align with those, those actions. And with this, uh, I stop. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, th thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you especially for linking the circular economy, energy and biodiversity uh, very concretely, Constant. Uh, we will certainly follow up with you on that thought um, beyond the seminar. I just wanted to all men also mention, although the time is very short, uh, do uh, indicate your questions in the Q&A uh, box as many have already done. And if we run out of time, which I think we will, uh, we will find a way to really get back either direct to the panelists or otherwise. Um, let me go to uh, Sean and then uh, close with Steve. Uh, I've got a couple of things. First of all, the command control point. I just want to pick up that point you made me bit on. Um, there is no doubt that rapid change requires a high degree of command and control but that doesn't quite lead us to the dictatorship of the Nazis because their model was very inefficient. And I'm just reading Adam Tuzer's book at the moment of the history of the economy of Nazi Germany compared to the American mobilization that happened at the same time. Now I'm deliberately using war analogies because I think that's what we're into. We certainly need war level scaling up of solutions to make this change. In the US, in World War II, there was certainty of demand provided, guaranteed offtake agreements, those sorts of things. There were certainly some rules set about what you will no longer do. You will no longer build consumer cars. You'll only build tanks. Well, the equivalent would be you will no longer build coal mines. There's room for that, of course. There's certainly a protection against extraneous shocks. I mentioned earlier, while business-like certainty, we have non-linear change hitting us now. It's going to be extreme and it's going to be crazy. Government can, to a certain degree, ensure against that, including providing resilient measures for the economy, learning from the last two years of pandemic about what's required to ensure that the economy doesn't collapse when a crash does happen. And then within that, there is a real need to step back and allow corporate dynamism within that for enabling and supportive framework, because that's what Nazi Germany messed up <laughs> and what the US got right. And that's what will help us get out of this particular hole we're in, the innovation that comes from the corporate world with those other things addressed. So I want to just stress that. I also want to say climate, nature, circular economy and resilience are separate flavors of gelato, but it's all gelato. They are all part of the issue of sustainable stewardship of the panel, of the world, I should say, when we are messing it up royally. And we need to be thinking that way. We need to be thinking. 
And now this is something that doesn't work in some countries. In China, when I talk about nature, people don't get it. The Shenzhen International Free Trade Zone is understood as the best in climate and green and sustainable. It is fantastic, incredibly energy efficient air conditioning, a third the energy use of Singapore per square meter and so on and so on. It's brilliant. But the concept of enabling nature is just not part of the repertoire. And maybe this is Chinese history, I don't know. And yet we know that now that we're in the middle of the sixth great biodiversity extinction, the first one ever induced by a species nominally in charge, we've got to work on the nature side of it to ensure the resilience of our world and our economies and our societies. Because if we don't have nature, everything else will fall apart. Everything from bees pollinating crops to the role of worms in our soils. Insects, for example, are critical in the ecosystem. This has to be understood and promoted as part of the solution to climate change, not as some extraneous separate issue. And of course, circular economy for reasons you'll all understand. I want to add in resilience though, especially in ASEAN, because in a, in a, non a world of non-linear non -linear change, volatility, the resilience, especially among small people in Indonesia and Philippines, is a critical measure for us to address, unless we're going to have consign ourselves to mass movements of people that will destroy any economic development growth that we have and collapses of economies. So in terms of the center's work, there's all that discussion, but I will frame it, I will tighten it sharper. But the work that is needed, the work I need, the word we all need, is a lot more analysis, evaluation, and promotion of the shopping list for activities for governments and corporations and investors, particularly the public sector. Let's call it the blended finance agenda. What exists, not green, by the way, most of it is not green. As I said, we've used it 200 years successfully to varying degrees of different economy. It's applied to green at evaluation. China is in the middle of this huge experiment on green finance. Seven provinces bring in new measures. There's no public evaluation. They haven't got the evaluation tools. You could help. Thank you. Thank you very much for that pointed uh, comment. Uh, let me just mention uh, that uh, Ben, at any point, uh, please come in as well, because these are very interesting suggestions. Also, for example, uh, that not to think of our various areas as sectors or different things, but the interlinkages that Sean mentioned as well, seamless and how to understand it that way is absolutely fundamental to see a different uh, scenario. And on that, uh, you would notice that the younger generation, I mean, we see it in the classroom, uh, the number of project proposals that are nature related and climate related is just, just uh, extraordinary compared to even 10 years ago. But will, they, will there be enough time for that change of mindsets uh, to make a difference on the policy and action side? So again, I leave that as a rhetorical question. You may or may not pick it up. Um, uh, so just to give us a, a, a time frame, I think about 15 minutes from now, we'll close. So um, Steve is going to go next. And after that, we've taken three questions. Let me just mention a fourth one. Um, and uh, that is from Gandhar on uh, the example of blockchain. But the bottom line is, how can we get the private sector to collaborate? and participate in such uh, platforms uh, to address uh, a, a crisis like climate change. So again, I leave that uh, to you to come back to. Uh, go ahead, uh, Steve. Thanks, there's, there's so much to cover, isn't there? I mean, I'll, again, I'm gonna pick up on some of Sean's comments about, you know, I don't think command and control is the way to do this, but, but we can, we can send messages to corporates with the right regulation, the right influence already. Yeah, we don't have to ban coal fired power stations, although it's still possible to raise funding for coal power, power stations. It's almost impossible now to get insurance for those projects, uh, because most of the insurance for projects of that scale and magnitude comes out of Europe and most of those big European insurers are now prohibited by their boards of directors and stakeholders to invest in those sorts of projects. So, so we can't cut off 
third world and developing countries that are trying to grow their way out of problems with power generation using coal. But we can use those sorts of tools of the financial community and some of the stuff that Sean's involved in as well to really steer things in the right direction through mandate and regulation. Um, so I definitely believe that's one of the ways we can push. From a pool factor, I'm personally involved. I mean, one of your questions is talking about uh, what types of collaboration do are most effective. Well, I'm involved through uh, an NGO called Earth Security in trying to work out how we can protect the few remaining mangroves, coral reef, and upland forests in the Philippines. Um, and we're doing that through manipulating, I have to use that word, the insurance sector over in the Philippines. I've worked in the insurance sector or around the insurance sector a long time. I know what their triggers are like, but it has to be a big collaboration right across the whole business ecosystem. So we're working with the leading insurers who want to change, who want to factor in mangroves, because long story short, if you have a mangrove and you get hit by a windstorm or a tidal surge, uh, it actually reduces the potential damage by about 60%, whereas a seawall reduces it about 10% of that sort of order. Um, so we have to work with the insurers, we have to work with the insurance community, the community and their board and the regulator are all now offering prizes for the insurers who can develop the best policies that favour this. And of course, then you have to work with the customers who are going to have to suck it up for a few pilots and pay a little bit more so that this sort of product can become available in the marketplace. So these are, these are long-term projects with a lot of collaborators. They do not get fixed overnight. And um, I definitely agree with Sean that the Adolf Hitler approach is not the way. It has to be through education and collaboration. Um, I'll stop there so we've got time to, to, to look at some of the questions, but of course we could all go on a lot longer. Excellent. Wow. Okay. Again, I, I hear the interlinkages that you're mentioning and that mangrove example, I think is, is really powerful. Um, very good. Let me um, add one more question from uh, uh, the Q&A um, chat box. You can see them directly because in my summary, I might miss the richness and the nuances, but uh, this is fascinating. Actually, I hadn't thought about this. Um, uh, and it goes um, uh, something like this from Dr. Salil. Um, yeah, uh, when public, private, civil, military, and, and focus on that armed forces, all unify for action, uh, can a new paradigm for public policy evolve? Uh, and so the role of uh, uh, military and our armed forces around the world on which uh, more is spent than on education and health. Uh, where does that fit in? And that usually doesn't get much of a hearing in these in this particular context. So that would be one uh, question I leave for uh, any of you to uh, pick up. Uh, we can kind of have a last round uh, of literally a, a minute each kind of thing, and you can choose whether you go with one of those questions or something you want to say. And if you didn't say it now, you may not have. Uh, good sleep tonight, so you can come back to that as well. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so um, uh, at, at this point, uh, would you just raise your hand? Who would like to come back in? Um, uh, it doesn't have to be in the same order anymore. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Steve. Mm -hmm. I think the military one's quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, and this is this is part of the challenge. When we have, you know, as, as was touched on before, the figures in terms of what we want to spend for climate change compared to what suddenly appeared out of nowhere for the pandemic, because it was a real and immediate issue, it got resolved. The same thing could be said about military spend globally. And we've all seen the geopolitical issues. And let's not get lost in that rabbit hole of what's happening at the moment and how it's emerging. But yeah, there's a huge amount of money that's being diverted there. And whether we should have, uh, you know, to use the, the, the example I gave, whether we should have the military planting trees or whatever, instead of, you know, the, 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 the swords into plowshares analogy, or, or whether they, that we should just stop spending so much on the militaries in different parts of the world. 
that these are very relevant questions. And of course, when we go to COP27 in Glasgow, um, it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of that as concrete. Uh, even if it gets as if it gets as far as Paris, I'll be delighted, but I'll be shocked as well. Um, I mean, Paris itself was uh, was pretty weak and watered down. Um, I suspect that uh, Glasgow will be a jolly for the boys again, and they'll all get their private jets over there and have a wonderful time, and then they'll go home again. Um, so I'm not that hopeful that we're going to see a lot of change this year, but we will see a lot of talk. I think that's always an opportunity for for those of us who are passionate about these topics to really try and get the agenda moving forward. Very interesting, very good. Yeah, I thought that was intriguing as well. Um, okay, I think I see Constant ready to go, but may I, uh, purely in the interest of time, also interject two questions. Uh, if you can't keep track, it is on the Q&A. Uh, Radhika, Radhika Rao asks um, uh, a very, uh, a good pickup of Constance's comment about the 250 companies that haven't uh, kept uh, or unlikely to keep their promise. Uh, how can policymakers increase accountability? Uh, we know who emits what and how much. I mean, now uh, the latest uh, reports from account uh, the accountability studies uh, literally now connect cost and effect, which wasn't possible by event, uh, so they are connected to directly to fossil fuels. So accountability is easier, like smoking and cancer, in the case of climate change. So why, why the question would be uh, accountability for the private sector to make good on these commitments. Uh, why could we not do that is uh, Radhika's question. <clears throat> uh, maybe uh, I'll keep the last one uh, uh, for a minute. Uh, so, uh, was it uh, Kavik Kumar who was, wanted to come in, and and after that, constant? Yeah, constant. Yeah, if if you don't mind, just in the 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 lieu, I mean, keeping time in mind, uh, just a few top liners. Especially, I think I saw two questions: one from Gandhar and one from Talisha. So I'll just probably give some short statements on that. I think the use of uh, blockchain definitely has a viability in the sustainability space for traceability and transparency. But at the same time, uh, blockchain is a unregulated technology. In many markets, it's self-regulated in many ways. So there have been clear cases of exploitation on human uh, identity, human biodata, iris data scanning. I think the UN has used uh, iris scanning for, you know, uh, uh, you know, administration of uh, some uh, food aid in Jordan. And of course, there's been use of blockchain to also receive food aid during in refugee camps as well. So, you know, how do we enforce the concept of informed consent when we collect all this data from these refugees without your knowledge? So there are some social nuances to that. So I won't say it's, it's a ready-made solution. There are some considerations, which of course, policy can help. And I think the next question to Talisha, I think she was asking about LCAs uh, and how, you know, how we can come up with standards across the board and especially the Asian ASEAN region or Asian region. So I, I think that's a very good question as well. And that's where um, standardization has to come into play. I think uh, uh, institutions or industry associations should come together to level up the playing field for LCA calculations. Many a times LCA cal calculations can be manipulated to really look good on paper. But in fact, you know, it could be highly carbon intensive in many ways. So I would say uh, standardization is very important. I think that's one area that the industry should come together to level up the playing field. And I hope that happens in, in quick time. But of course, happy to take the conversation outside as well. So please feel free to reach out and yeah, maybe pass the time over to the rest of the speakers too for the inputs. Uh, very good. Please do take uh, 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 on his offer to follow up on that last LCA question which we may not have too much time to cover, but I think you, you gave a, a good opening on that. And so Constant, there was a direct question to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to comment uh, on LCA is ISO 14040. So those standards exist, they've been in existence for 30 years. Um, then the, to the question on uh, accountability, it's relatively simple. Make TCFD mandatory and introduce a price of carbon. And it's, it's also the in, in the interest of companies to look at their portfolio 
and how they can do the energy transition because that's the only way for them to survive. Those who, who kind of negate this you know, uh, mega trend or this trend will just not be with us very long. We have, uh, as an industry association, we have a, a hub uh, for our 200 member companies to actually exchange on how to do it. And we, you know, they acknowledge, you know, we are a different level of maturity in, in, in the journey towards net zero. Some just started and some consider themselves are more advanced. So we have those, this internal collaboration amongst our membership who share you know, their journey, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, so it's a journey and some are at the beginning, some are a bit more advanced, but yet it's a journey and everybody acknowledges this. So yeah, TCFD mandatory, try to get the carbon price uh, you know, harmonized everywhere. Excellent. Um, well, that's uh, a terrific uh, a direct response as well. Um, I, I, I think, I don't know if anyone wants to have any further comment on that LCA and standards because I, you know, it connects with the accountability question and there are, you know, even the way we rank countries on economic growth, uh, those who pollute the most and grow fastest are number one, right? So if only we could change our way of looking at things uh, and it is transparent and um, there is as little greenwashing as possible. Uh, there are some efforts at that, but none of them are policy oriented in the sense that they don't get attention. I don't know if anyone wants, but GDP is gross, it's gross national product. It's gross, it's not net. And that's how we give rewards and investment flows to those with the highest gross national product, not net of damages that are being caused. So why are we surprised that uh, the incentives are really stacked totally the wrong way? And we've been going on with that for 60, 70 years. And so this question, it intrigued me, that last question about a LCA and you know, uh, standards and having common uh, uh, ways of uh, accounting for uh, the good things we do and the bad things we do. And can business lead even more in saying, look, this is, uh, this is the reality and this is how we're going to measure success. Anyway, without forcing your hand, um, I, uh, I was given permission, given the incredible quality of the panelists and the questions and answers um, that uh, we might go a few minutes over and Sean, had raised the hand, I think. Uh, so please do come in. Sure, and I'll have to apologize myself. I've got to leave on the half hour, I'm afraid. But um, on standards, look, there's a whole global discussion on standards underway. We're involved in many of them, as is MAS, by the way. So plug in, expand, enhance, absolutely. Some of them, some renovation activities, GDP, for example, may take a little bit longer, but there's a whole lot of sustainability standards. Uh, I want to just leave you for parting thought on the military question. One thing we know, threat reduction is more effective, efficient than threat response. We will need threat response capability because we are entering a world of volatility. There will be conflict and we're going to have to manage that conflict, dampen it. That is unfortunately where we are. The only hope Singapore has, has to have, is to have a global community allied to the same agenda. And forget about super state conflict. I don't care about that. That's a diversion. I'm talking about the conflict arising out of collapsed states because we're going to see a lot more of that going forward. And Singapore is in a neighborhood that's going to see some high risk of that happening. Threat reduction is what counts. Let's learn something from the bond market that I work in. It's all about defensiveness. Defensiveness is about risk mitigation. And that's what the Institute should focus on tools for risk mitigation to ensure that we can do what needs to happen and to ensure we head off catastrophe and minimize, dampen, let's say, the volatility that we're going to experience. And that applies to financial markets as well as the real economy, by the way. So that's the connection. Bonds, threat reduction, risk mitigation. Okay, uh, excellent. 
Um, well, uh, there is a direct question following up uh, again to Constant. You might take a look at that, and uh, uh, if you are kind enough to reply later, uh, I think that would be great. Um, uh, so I think it's my time um, to close the session, and I won't try to do a summary because you can imagine the richness of this discussion doesn't lend itself in a good way uh, to simple summaries. Uh, but I do want to just name a few words or things, uh, connecting the dots and the linkages will stay with us. Uh, the you know, policy business angle to be kind of brought together, changing mindsets of, uh, and uh, thinking differently. And the policy school advice in, it came in many forms. So thank you very much for that, uh, to, to be a bridge, um, uh, including between business and government. So. We thank you very much, uh, Ben, and I, I say this on your behalf uh, as much, and it would be great if we can stay in touch uh, and follow up uh, both ways, you know, in your work, if we can help, great, and uh, uh, we might uh, uh, call on you as well. As I'm looking at the words from the group, uh, they are all thank yous, uh, and um, we'll send you the questions after the event in case you would like to look through. And, uh, and on behalf of the uh, uh, people who participated also, I thank the panelists and the panelists uh, were absolutely wonderful and the organizers of this event as well. Um, so wish you the best, wish the planet the best, wish the business and government and academia the best and uh, humanity the best. Thank you. Thanks everybody, thank you.